The UDR cast is not affiliated and does not represent any 12-step fellowship. I, Bill Ward, the host of the UDR cast, will be sharing my experience and my journey of recovery. That does include, but is not limited to, the literature contained in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps. Our guests will be sharing their own path to recovery and what has worked for them. The UDR cast encourages and supports all paths to recovery. Welcome everybody to the UDR cast. UDR stands for Uncover, Discover and Recover. My name is Bill Ward and I'm coming to you from the recovery capital of Canada, Calgary, Alberta. Here we are going to discuss everything recovery, different perspectives, different experiences, both with the people I know and with others from around the world. If you resonate with anything you've heard on this episode today, we ask that you share it with anyone who you think may benefit from it. If you have any questions or comments, please find us at billward.life and send us a message in the info section. We'll get back to you as soon as we can. If you are interested in more recovery content, you can find the buttons for the YouTube channel and other social media outlets on the homepage, and you will be redirected to those platforms. We can recover, one person, one family, one community at a time. Well, yeah, so like really, and I'm explaining this more for the new people and I can't really go into detail for you new people because there was so much material covered, but essentially I live my life based on everything that I learned in this world. And when I live my life that way, I build up belief systems and ideologies in my head of how the world should be, how I should be and how you should be. And when you don't live up to the, so it's kind of like this, I have a script that I've fucking written in my head of how I should be and how you should be and how everything should be. And then when you guys don't live up to my script, because I've never given you the script, I get resentful, I get pissed off, the world fucks me, the world's dominating me, you guys are all fucking me. And then what happens? The world's happening to me and you guys are doing things to me and everything is to me, why? Because the world told me that it's all about me. My life is all about me. Go get this, have the right job and go to the right school and get all these things and have the right wife and get the white picket fence and have all these things. Why? For you, Bill, so that you can be happy. Well, where did I learn that? I learned it in my world that I grew up in. They started teaching me that shit right in school. Started teaching me that shit on the billboards and the magazines and the fucking TV shows and everything. We talk about this as the program, like we're in the program here. Well, out there is a program too. The only thing is that program actually makes us spiritually sick. And for the alcoholic who is spiritually sick, we need a fucking solution for our spiritual sick. And so for the spiritual sickness we have, we need a spiritual solution. So if I live in the spiritual sickness as an alcoholic addict, as an addict alcoholic, I don't have a choice in picking up a drink or a drug. In the step one, it talks about, I, can, I can't remember with sufficient force, the memory, the pain, and the suffering of a day a week ago, a week ago, or a month ago. I am without defense and I pick up the drink. Does anyone relate with fucking look at my life when I drink and do drugs, but then I go and pick it up again, right? It's because you can't remember. It talks about in the book, the alcoholic at a certain point will have no effective mental defense against the first drink. So if you're using a mental defense, well, what's a mental defense? Oh, I stay away from the fucking bars. I stay away from those people. I stay away from all these places. I'm using a mental defense. Through the mental defense, now I implement a physical defense. I stay away from those places. What's another mental defense? Oh, I remember every time I fucking drink, my kids don't have a dad, right? CFS gets involved. All of these things happen in my life. So then I don't pick up the drink. What am I doing though? I'm, I'm thinking about not drinking, but really I'm thinking about drinking, right? Wouldn't it be nice to get to a place where you don't think about drinking and you don't think about not drinking? You just think about living your life to the best you can. That's what this program will fucking take you to, right? But we're on step four right now. 
And step four is where the, weir- the real work begins, right? Step one is super important to understand the actual disease, why I pick up a drink when I don't want to. You know, I did a share today at a meeting and it was like someone had shared on, uh, I, pu- I push the fuck it button every time. I push the fuck it button. And my share was, no, the fuck it button pushes you. Because once you understand the illness, you don't have a choice in picking up the drink. That's why you're powerless. The word powerless in the first step means fucking powerless. And when you fucking live this and you understand step one and then you go drink and you will see that you're actually powerless over drinking. But then no one really focus on the on the uh, unmanageability of step one. Well, what's the unmanageability? The unmanageability is I can't control my emotional natures. I get angry at people. I fucking cry at the drop of a hat. I'm judging people. I'm fucking in anxiety. I can't control my emotional natures. I'm prey to misery and depression. You know, I can't seem to make a living. I have a feeling of uselessness. But I like the, we're prey to misery and depression. Like a lot of alcoholics get misery and depression. Depression, anxiety. Most depression and anxiety for alcoholics is just untreated alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the state of depression, you're fucking going down the levels of consciousness. You get to these lower levels of guilt and shame. Then suicidal thoughts come in because you're fucking so low in the levels of consciousness that there's nothing you can do. Because misery and depression prey on you. And when you look up the word prey, it says an animal that hunts and stalks another to eat and kill. That's what fucking misery and depression and anxiety do to people. It hunts you, it stalks you, and it wants to kill you. But it doesn't kill you. You fucking kill yourself. So understanding that you don't push the fuck it button. The fuck it button pushes you. Because you're powerless over fucking drugs and alcohol. And what drives the fuck it button pushes you? Pushing you? Is the spiritual malady. Living in the shit that we're going to talk about tonight. That nobody's really ever lived or seen. Right? So, fast forward. We get to the step three prayer. We do the step three prayer. People have done the step three and then go fuck. I've turned my will and my life over. Just saying the prayer. I've done this. Right? And I hear it all the time. Oh yeah, me and God, we're fucking great. I've been on step three for like eight months. My life and my will is... (laughs) Right? My life and will is turned over. You know, it's such a load of horseshit because you don't understand your fucking will just because you did a prayer. But the ego is so powerful, it doesn't want to be left out. It wants the validation. And part of our disease is the disease of validation. We want to be validated by everybody and everything, right? But it's based in like an emotional security that's kind of within the deeper part of the work that we do. But the step three decision, just because you take it, doesn't really mean that much. Other than you've made a commitment to maybe change your life. And really, once you understand that step three prayer, really what it is, is you're getting down on your knees. You're asking God to build with you, do with you as he will. Relieve you of the bondage of self. Take away my difficulties. What are my difficulties? My difficulties are my defects of character. And my defects of character are actually what caused me all my difficulties. My defects of character are what caused the prey to misery and depression. My defects of character are everything that fucks up my life. But it's not, I don't know that because I just live life with it. And everyone else in the world is too. But not everyone else in the world has a progressive fatal illness like I do. And if I don't get a handle on this progressive fatal illness, the last part is fatal. It fucking kills you. Right? And like we had another death out here today on the nation because of what we're talking about today. Right? And there's about one a week out here. And I don't know what it's like at Siksika, but I'm sure it's very similar. Right? And in the city, it's similar. It's similar everywhere. People are dropping like flies because... Because no, they don't understand the illness. Well, it's just like my best friend, Daniela, her, her dad died of um, sickness. Right. And then it looks like, oh, drugs killed him. Mm-hmm. Well, it is the drugs that ultimately kill some of these people. But really, the spiritual malady is what fucking actually is killing them. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And when you understand all these pieces that I'm talking about, 
you start understanding why we need God, why we need creator, higher power, whatever you want to call it. Because I wanted to change and I tried to change, but I could never change. I could have these moral beliefs that I lived by, that I believed. I could have these philosophical convictions. I could read the books. I could fucking do the exercises. I could go to Buddha. I could do all these things, but I couldn't change my behaviors. So what I've learned in this program is if I'm really willing to fucking change, I ask God to help me and God has helped me fucking change. And I don't see people change without fucking God. And like just to qualify myself for the people that don't know me, I've fucking sponsored hundreds and hundreds of people one on one with about 30 or 40,000 hours of fucking understanding this illness. And I'll tell you one thing. The shit I'm talking about is fucking true. So you can believe me or you think I'm full of shit. And the guys that think I'm full of shit, and there's lots of them, trust me. Usually in that first year, as they hear me say what I'm saying, in the meetings or wherever, they're like, fuck that guy. You know what happens? Two years later, they're coming begging me to fucking help them. Because they say, everything you said is true, bro. And I'm like, I know it is, bro. I sure I'll help you. And then, but at least then now they're willing, right? Because they got a fucking understanding of their illness because they understood step one at least probably, right? So as we do that step three prayer, build with me, do with me as thou wilt. Everyone wants fucking help. They're desperate and they get on their knees and they're doing anything because they want to stop using. The thing is, is that prayer is so powerful. When you get on your knees and you say the, the step three prayer, now the universe has heard that prayer and it's going to do what you asked it to do. And part of the rebuilding with me, doing with me as thou wilt, is I got to strip down all of the shit that fucking's not serving me anymore. And it doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve the world. And to strip down my anger and my fucking lust and my gambling and my porn and all of the stuff that's under that, trust me, it's fucking painful. Because for you to fucking relinquish a defense mechanism or a behavior that you've used all your life to try to protect yourself and try to let that go, it's fucking not easy. So I always say, do what's, e do what's hard, do this work, do it with the desperation of a drowning man. Don't do it by yourself, do it with creator, do it with your pillars, and you can fucking do anything and you can be anything in this world. The only thing you can't do is drink and use drugs. But the thing about this program is if you follow the directions, not the idea of what it is or a theory, you follow the directions in the book, you will live a life where you don't want to fucking use drugs. The God drug will be the drug that you fucking want. And then the more God that you have, the more you light up, the more that you shine. And you've all seen those people, right? Those people that just shine and they exude something that you want, right? People don't want ego. People don't want pride. People don't want those lower levels of fear-based behaviors. And you can feel those. When people act in pride and anger and fucking show off shit, fucking it just pushes you away. And it's an energy that pushes you away. But when people are like acting in love and they're fucking exuding love and you fucking want that, right? And that's what we're trying to do here. If we can all like light up our lives and shine the brightest that we can, we can help somebody else. So I'll just finish that step three prayer. It says, allow me to do these things, God. Build with me, do with me as I will. Relieve me of the bond itself. Take away these difficulties for one reason. What's the reason why we do all this work? So that I can give to others the most you need. Right. Help other people. Right. To live to their maximum, what they're put here for. Right. So we are trying to be of maximum service. Yeah. So all that being said, I'm going to do a quick rundown of what we did last week because there's so many new people here. I'll try not to spend a lot of time on it. I'll do my best. <laughs> it's God's will. Okay, so I'm going to start at the bottom of 63 quickly. I'm going to reread a few things and just touch on a few things for some of the newer people. And maybe some of us, others, you could have a refresher. 
So bottom of 63, after we read the step three prayer. So we got down on our knees, we did the step three prayer, and this prayer is now in the universe, and now fucking creator is like expecting our part to be done. And like the universe is now working for that. But the thing about building with me and doing with me as thou wilt, it does that, doesn't always look like how I want it, right? It doesn't look like how I want it to look. And it's not always going to be a fucking happy, easy road. Through the challenges in your life is where you learn shit, right? Like some of the worst things you've ever been through, you're like, whoa, fuck, I'm never doing that again. Right? <laughs> because it was fucking painful and you learned a lesson, right? That's kind of how this might go. The thing about early recovery is a lot of early recovery is pretty fucking gravy, right? You fucking sail through early recovery because you, you don't have a job. You don't have a place to stay. You get the job. Oh my God, it's God. Right? <laughs> you, you, you get your license back because you actually put in the work to get your license back. It's like, oh my God, God's so great. Right? And then you get to the second year where life gets real and you haven't built a real relationship with God. Now life's fucking pounding on you because you haven't built a solid relationship with God. As you go more into your recovery, you need way more fucking God than you ever did in the first year. And through what we're talking about tonight, we're talking about inventory in a big, large part. That's how I clear this channel. And a huge part of this is done in step 10, right? You go to the meetings and you fucking bring up what, ask step 10 to be the topic. The number one thing you're gonna hear in the meetings on what step 10 is, is, oh, I do step 10s all the time. I always make amends when I'm wrong. I always promptly make amends or correct my behaviors when I'm wrong. That is fucking not step 10. That is not a personal inventory. That is you self-willing your principles into your life to seek relief because you're basing it in self-centered fucking guilt. So it's still actions based in self and it doesn't fucking do what you want it to do. And you, you work that kind of step 10, you'll get to the point where you're like, is this all sobriety is? Is this all it is? Maybe I should just fucking drink. <laughs> well, you know what? Maybe you fucking should. Because you'll get a real fucking condition, uh, ideal of your condition. And maybe God will guide you to somebody who knows what the fuck they're doing. Because most of the rooms do not fucking understand step 10 or step 6. And then nobody is fucking sponsoring, which is the greatest gift in the program. So what the fuck, what the fuck are we talking about, right? So as we go through this step four, this is the very first beginning part of the inventory. Okay, let's read. Okay. Bottom of 63. Next, we launched on the course of vigorous action. The first step of which is a personal house cleaning, of which many of us had never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step. So none of us did a house cleaning ever in our life. We've never taken personal inventory on ourselves, right? I've taken your fucking inventory, I'll tell you that. <laughs> most of my life, right? And we all do that. We'll take everyone else's inventory, but we've never taken our own. And where it says, though this decision, what's the decision that he's talking about? Anyone? Yeah. Step three decision. Though this decision that I took in step three is a vital, which means important, but it also means vitality. It can give you life. It can give you really good life if you understand how to turn it over. So it's vital and it's a crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves that have been blocking us. So I need this step to take permanent effect. For the alcoholic addict who is actually powerless and hopeless, has the this, this spiritual malady that's progressive and fatal, this step is really important to make permanent. That's why most people don't stay sober, is because they don't understand how to make it permanent, because they don't understand step 10, they don't understand even the depth of step 3, and we just go on with living our lives and self-willing the principles into our life. But if we just self-will the principles into our life, we're self-willing it based in fucking self. So we're still fucking running the show. But my ego's so powerful, it can think that God's running the show. But that's not what's actually happening. 
And a guy like me, I can spot that shit in a conversation with people fucking in a split second, right? So a lot of people are afraid to come and talk to me based on that. But a lot of people really will come and talk to me because they want to know the truth. They might be a little skeptical at first <laughs> because I'm going to tell you the truth about like based on my experience and knowledge. But I always do it in a kind and loving way, but I might be a little firm, but I, all, I do it. <laughs> I do it because I fucking care. Right? And Anna knows. For anyone that doesn't know, Anna had one year sober. She was around. She was that person in the room. It's like, fuck, God's great. Everything's great. I, I got my kids back. Everything's great. And she even made me cry in a meeting because she was so heartfelt. And then she went on with the business of being self-satisfied again. And I didn't see her. And I messaged her one day. I'm going back years ago. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? She's like, fuck, not good. And then I just called her. I just fucking called her. Hey, how's it going? She's like, fuck, no, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then I just tore her strips off of her, right? I'm like, fuck, you're an alcoholic addict. You don't fucking get it, man. If you don't fucking do what you're supposed to do, you're fucking fucked. And she hadn't drank in yet. But like, I don't know, a few months later, she's fucking drunk, right? And she was burning it down again. And then, then she came back. And then she's done everything she's told to do. And fucking she's, she's rocking it, right? Three and a bit years sober and fucking. But, you know, that's how, that's how we sometimes we have to learn, right? So face and be rid of the things in ourselves that have been blocking us. I'm blocked off from God. I need to face and be rid of these things in myself that block me from God. So when we talk about God, you don't need to go look for God out there. We don't need to go search for God out here, okay? God exists right in us, but he's blocked off. So I need to face and be rid of these things. And facing some of the shit is painful. But that's where God is. In the back of the book, it talks about the unsuspected inner resource. I have an unsuspected inner resource. It's connected to the source. It's a resource, okay? It's right here, but it's all covered up. What covers it up? The world of the material. The ideas, the belief systems, the things that I think are going to make me happy, my anger, my judgment of you. Fucking, there's a whole list of things that cover this thing up, right? So I need to face those things. Her liquor was but a symptom. For anyone that thinks that the drugs and the alcohol are your problem, Underline that, triple underline it, because the alcohol and the drugs are a fucking symptom of the spiritual malady medication. You medicate the spiritual malady with the fucking drugs and the alcohol. So we had to get down to the causes and conditions. That's what step four does, okay? Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Most people that come into the program are broke. They're bankrupt. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and many times financially. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding, fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about stock and trade. So in the step four process, we look at the facts. You write down the facts. We're going to face the facts. And we're going to look at the truth about stock and trade. We're going to look at the truth about you. But the thing is, is it might not be your truth because your truth has been living skewed based in self your whole life. But that's part of the problem. So we have to look at it, but we got to get it down on paper. Okay? It is an effort to discover the truth about stock and trade. One object, so this is one object of what this work is for, is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods and get rid of them promptly without regret. If the owner, you, are to be successful in your life, in recovery, he cannot fool himself about the values. So I need to find these damaged and unsaleable goods that I'm using and discard them promptly without regret. And these goods are no good anymore. The goods are my anger, but anger is like a secondary emotion. It's the headline. Underneath anger is a whole bunch of other shit. Okay? When you... 
We talk about lust in the program as one of the defects. Lust is a headline. Underneath lust is a whole bunch more layers of, of things. So whatever the headline is, there's always layers to whatever it is, okay? The behavior might be, yeah, you're promiscuous, okay? The behavior might be, yeah, I fucking rage out in anger. The behavior might be you road rage, and so that's anger, right? But underneath all of these things is, is like ties to your emotional security. Maybe you're fucking road raging because you're running late all the time and you're, you need to get to work on time. But you're going to be late, so you're fucking mad at this guy because he's making you late, even though you press snooze four fucking times and fucking went and got a coffee at Starbucks and knew the lineup. And like, these are all the decisions you make in your life that cause this road rage. But the layers of this is where you'll see the real fucking juice, right? So, so we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we search out the flaws in our makeup, which caused our failure. So that's an important line. We search out the flaws in our makeup that cause our failure. Back in step three, there was a line that says, um, our problems we think arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is the most extreme example of self-will run riot, although he usually doesn't think so. So the alcoholic also in step three, it says he's driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. And like for anyone that's like on the fence about this program, I'll just say it like this. If you think that this book is some guy's theory or, or opinion, I fucking feel sorry for you. Because this book is not a guy's theory of opinion. This is fucking, this is the alcoholic and addict in plain English. And this, I have not met one alcoholic and addict that I worked with that was the real deal that this book didn't fucking describe to a T. So these flaws that arise out of myself, they're part of my makeup. They're like right in me. So the problems that arise out of myself, so the problems will be the behaviors, right? So I'm going to use the tree example. So we're going to look at the defects of character through the step four process tonight to some degree. And it's like a tree, okay? The tree has branches. And as you get to the branches, there's my anger, there's my lust, there's my gambling, there's my porn, there's my, there's my defects of character, there's my judgment, there's all the things that you can see, right? Whatever it is in you that you can see that you know are your defects. And some of them you'll see when you do the work. So as I start breaking these branches off, it's hard on the tree, so it's hard on me. And as I get further up the branch, the branches get thicker and the branches get harder to break. And sometimes I got to fucking like wiggle them and spin that fucking branch right <laughs> off, right? And fucking break these branches. But these are the defects and this is how embedded they are in me. And I get to the trunk of the tree and I start breaking this trunk now. And the trunk's hard to break, right? And then I get to the roots. And now I'm at the root of the problem. Where the problems arise out of me or deep down. And when you think of a tree's root system, the roots go fucking everywhere. And they cross over each other and they're fucking intertwined. And the root system is twice as big as the tree that you see standing. So the problem, I think, arises out of me deep down inside where I can't even see. Maybe it's abandonment. Maybe it's self-worth. Maybe it's you trying to fit in and, and fucking be good with all the different people in your life. So you people please, you're, you know, a people pleasing disease or you avoid conflict or whatever it is, right? There's so many things that this could be, but they all stem from the fucking roots. And then they come and they manifest themselves out in the behaviors of anger and, and judgment and lust and, and whatever else. But we can see the branches once we start doing this work. But over the years, you keep breaking those branches and your goal is to get down to the fucking trunk. And the trunk or the roots is actually, when we get there, is the third column. And the branches are the fourth column. Okay? So, let's go. So being convinced that self manifests itself in various ways is what had defeated us. Earlier in these chapters, it talked a lot about self. And for the people that have been around the program a while, they understand this way more than anybody knew. But selfish self-centeredness is the root of our trouble. It's the main root of the trouble. Okay? And that's what fucks me. So, 
I've been thinking that the world's always fucking me. No, I fuck me. And it hurts. <laughs> we, so we considered its common manifestations. So the book is saying that we're considering the common manifestations of self. So if I'm only considering common shit, what about the uncommon shit? So this work that we're doing in this first set of steps that we do is just common stuff. But there's way more deeper roots that make this common stuff there in, in the first place. So the common manifestations of self, as per this book, are resentments, which we're doing tonight. Fear, which we may get to, but I doubt it. And, and sex conduct, but I'll call it relationship conduct. Because to me, it's way more about relationship conduct than it is actual sex conduct. So those are your three main object areas of this step four where you will see self and start learning about how you actually operate in this world that you've never really seen before. And for anyone new that's like, fuck, I, I have to be here or you feel like shameful to be here, you don't really know that you just entered into the greatest gift of your life. This program is the greatest gift you'll ever get in your life. And if you fucking take it as that and understand that, and you may not understand that till later, but this book is the greatest gift you'll ever get in your life. Is there anyone here that agrees with me? Yeah. Okay. And being an alcoholic and an addict, I'm grateful today because my mom doesn't have this program. My mom struggles with the spiritual malady. Like people out there don't have a solution to their life. They just live life and try their best and step on people's toes and Fuck, I finally found a solution, right? When God was handing out fucking manuals how life worked when I was a kid, he fucking missed me. <laughs> <coughs> he missed all of us. Right? <laughs> and then I sat in the rooms for a while and then I remember I was like two or three months in, in the program. I was at a meeting and I was just sitting there because about before I ever came to the program, I went to church like... And I hated church, right? But I started going to church all the time. And my wife's like, what the fuck are you going to church for? I'm like, never mind. <laughs> and I didn't know why I was going to church either. I just, but I look at it like this. God knew where I was broken. He was trying to help me. But I didn't know what I was doing. So I go to all these churches for like a year. And I'm like, fuck, what am I looking for? And then I fucking burned it down. I lost everything, right? And then I finally went to the meetings. My dad was in the program. So then I go to these meetings and then a month in or whatever it was, I was sitting in a meeting and I'm like, fuck, this is it. This is what you were looking for at church. Right? And then I did this work and I'm like, fuck, this is it too. This is that manual you were never handed out as a little fucking baby. Right? That little part that was in me that was missing, I found through the, through the book, right? It filled that hole. So resentment is the number one offender. So for unique new people, resentment is the number one offender. This, resentments will take you out over and over if you're new. Today, seven years sober, resentment's not the number one offender to me. Fear is. Fear is the number one offender for people that are working the program solid. And we're fucking pretty conscientious of fear. Because if we don't deal with the fear, we're back at resentment. But for you new people, resentment will take you out over and over and over. And it will kill you like it says here. Resentment is number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of different spiritual diseases. For we have not only been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. Super important line. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. So again, because I live in a spiritual malady, I create so much anxiety and craziness in my brain. I create my own mental illness. And then the world focuses only on mental health, right? So because I have a bad spiritual conditioning, I don't really know that because nobody's teaching me that in the real world. But they're teaching me that I got these mental health issues. So yeah, I, I fucking relate. I got anxiety. I got depression. I got this. I got that. I got this. So then what do I do? I go to the doctor and I say, here's all my symptoms. He's like, oh, okay, here's some Xanax. Here's some more pills. Here's some this. Here's some that. But the root of the problem, the tree roots, is never dealt with. 
so that the mental health issues that I actually work with, they actually turn into physical liabilities. We create tumors, we get other illnesses. And when you think about most of the illnesses on the planet, so many of them, the doctors are like cause unknown. The physical illness, cause unknown, cause unknown, cause unknown. Well, it comes from bad mental health. Because what are we doing? Well, we're living in fear. You know, when I used to, before I ever came to recovery years ago, when I had my business, I'd walk out the door and now I'm in fear. I walk out the door. I'm fearful of fucking this. I'm fearful of not having enough money. I'm fearful of my wife fucking being a bitch. I'm fearful of, I'm fearful of everything. And I'm in a constant state of fucking fear. My body's not designed to be in a constant state of fear 24 hours a day. So when I'm in a constant state of fear, I create chemicals in my body that create illnesses in my body. And that anxiety and all the stuff in my head create all these physical illnesses. But nobody's really focusing on the spiritual part. Because the spiritual part is so much more important than the mental health part. And I'm not saying anything bad about mental health. Because it's part of it. But we don't work the mental health instead of the spiritual health. We work the spiritual health and bring in the mental health to it. But the world as a whole, like you go to AHS, they ain't telling you, fuck, you know what? Have you been praying and meditating? <laughs> have, you been doing, have you been doing inventory? Have you been going to sweats? Have you been sun dancing? You know, like, and when I say uh, spiritual wellness, I don't mean just praying and meditating, okay? To me, the biggest part of spirituality is fucking inventory. Without inventory, without taking a deep look at what and who you are and what drives you, the prayer and the meditation, who fucking cares? Really, right? The, the inventory work from my experience as a sponsor in my own life, it's so much, it's not more important, but it's equally as important but it is the piece of this program that actually gets tossed to the side the quickest. So if you're willing to work your fucking inventories as part of your daily life, working it with prayer and meditation, using your pillars, your peers, to help call you on your shit, because I can't really see my shit, because I live in a delusional state of fucking fear and self-delusion, even when I'm trying to be objective in my own life, I still need to call Barb and say, look, this is the situation. She's like, Bill, you're fucking in resentment, you fucker. <laughs> Go make an amend. You need to make an amend and you need to pray and you need to ask God to remove that fucking judgment. And I'm like, fuck, I didn't see that. Why? Because I'm living my life based on the best of intention. Underneath your best intention is your motives of selfishness way down where the fucking roots are. And once you start seeing that shit and you start like working this program, like in like, these ways I'm talking about, you're just like, whoa, holy shit. And then you'll catch self trying to fuck your life up and you'll be like, fuck you. <laughs> you're like, not today, self. Not today, self pity. So sometimes they give my sponsees like I'll say, okay, I'm giving you one minute of self-pity a day. <laughs> That's all you get. Fucking you can use 10 seconds here, 20 seconds there, 30 seconds here. But once you've used up a minute, that's it. Right? Because so many people will fall into the trap of self-pity, right? Which takes you to the depression and all these other things, right? But if you're mindful of that, like, fuck, this is self-pity. Fuck, you only gave me 60 seconds. What am I... <laughs> what am I going to do with the rest? It's true. These are the tricks you learn as a sponsor, man. It's... Yeah. I'm starting to see that. Right? <laughs> Okay, so that line again for anyone new or anyone that's not new but is struggling and doesn't really get this program. When the spiritual malady is overcome, then you straighten out mentally. And down the road, you will want to take care of your body and you will straighten out physically. That's just the natural path of how this works. So, in dealing with resentments, usually I get people to put a baby number one right before in dealing because that is your first column on the next page so baby number one in 
dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. After paper, you put a baby number two right, b- right before we. Mm-hmm. No, sorry, 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 sorry. I made a mistake. We listed has the baby number one. Okay. So we listed had the baby number one. People, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. After angry is the baby number two. We asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found it was our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore, we were burned up. The baby number three goes right before on our grudge list. So baby number three, on our grudge list, we set opposite each name or injuries. Was it self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal or sex relations, which had been interfered with? And then, as you have the one, two, and three in the literature, you can put the one, two, and three over the columns in the book because that's essentially what we're doing. So in the first column, we write who it is. So Bill W., when he wrote this book, he used these examples. And in the first column, he wrote Mr. Brown. Well, what did Mr. Brown do so Bill was pissed off at him? Well, Mr. Brown, the cause, his attention to my wife. I guess this guy was checking out Lois. (laughs) And told my wife of my mistress. Okay? And Mr. Brown may get my job at the office. So this guy is like, now he's living in all these fears in his head, right? So he's building all these fears and resentments of things that he thinks is happening. And, and maybe parts of them are happening. Like he, he did tell his wife about his mistress, but the guy's using a fucking mistress. So of course he's going to be in fear. And what's his fear producing on these other sides? Well, the attention to his wife, and especially if Buddy told him about his mistress, his sex relations is going to be threatened. So he writes sex relation. His self-esteem is going to be threatened because he's probably worried about losing his wife and now his own self-worth is at, at stake, right? His sex relations for the next one, self-esteem, his security for his job, Brown may get the job at the office. So now it's his financial security and his material security. So that's what it's affecting. So this, this first three columns for anyone that's new or not new This is shit you live your whole life anyway, doing. You know who it is. You know that they, what they did to you. And you know that it hurt you. So for us to do this part of the work is really easy. We just need to write down what happened in our life and who we resentful at. And one good way to really find out who you're resentful at is when it says, you know, why we were angry. You look up the word anger. And you look up the word synonyms for anger. Because the synonyms give you different variations of what angry actually means. Because most people I've found that most people just think angry means like raging. And just angry. And the problem with us new alcoholics is we have so much pride that we don't want to admit we're angry. Right? But if you want to fucking grow, you got to look at yourself in a really constructive view. And it's not always going to be pretty. It's kind of like the disease of the, the drink. Until you conceded to your innermost self that you actually had the illness, you couldn't recover, right? Because you were denying it. You were still resisting it. And it's the exact same with lust. If you don't concede to your innermost self that you have fucking sexual relation problems and go, fuck, yeah, I have fucking serious sex relation problems and admit that, pride doesn't want to admit that though. But we have to get past that pride and we have to put it on paper. Like who wants to admit they're fucking angry and rageful? Nobody. Right? We always butter it up to make it softer. But that's part of the lies that we tell ourselves. The biggest problem with the alcoholic addict is they're not capable of honesty on their own. I will rationalize and justify the most errant nonsense to suit my actions in my life or my inaction. And when you think of the word rationalize... Rational lies. Mm -hmm. I tell myself a rational idea and then I fucking believe it because I fucking need to. 
And I call that false integrity. And it's the same dishonesty that will take me back to the drink. Knowing that this is no good for me and I can't get honest with myself. Well, it's fucking Lysol, so it's kind of appropriate, I guess. <coughs> Bad joke. But I am Indian, so I can get away with it. I can get away with it. But it's the same dishonesty that manifests itself back to the drink. And when we talk in this program about rigorous honesty, rigorous means accurate. Okay? Getting accurate with what and who you are is really important. And looking at yourself in a way that you've never looked at yourself before is so important. And it's the truth. When we talk about facing the facts, we don't want to face the facts this way sometimes. Because I built a story in my life of how I actually am. And I need to live up to that story. But then I have to look at the real story. And the real story is fucking, it's pretty painful. It's pretty ugly. Right? But in order for you to grow into a good person, to the, like, the best person you can be, you got to accept some pretty hard truths about yourself. So as we live these first three columns, one, two, three, you live it. Just write it down. Very simple. Don't do this work by yourself. Don't go home and say, I'm going to do the steps and now sit there by yourself doing the steps. <laughs> because you got an alcoholic mind that looks at things in a selfish way and you will never get the value that you need to get out of this unless you work with somebody else. That's just the fact. Okay. So we went back through the list or back through our lives. Nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was the world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others were wrong as far as most of us ever got. That's as far as us, most of us ever get. We're always blaming other people for our problems. If the government wouldn't have done this, if the insurance company wouldn't have done that, if my ex wouldn't have done this, if my mom wouldn't have done that. It's pretty plain to see that the world and its people are dominating me. Okay? The usual outcome was that pe people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse, probably meaning self-pity. You know, poor me, poor me, pour me another drink. Poor me, poor me, pour me another hoot. And then we were sore at ourselves. And then we guilt and shame ourselves. But the more we fought and used force and used pride and used all these broken parts of us, the more we fought to try to have it our own way, prying and snatching and grabbing and taking out of life to have it our way, like it talked about in step three in the after, the worse matters got. Because living a life in continual self-reliance and you've crossed the line in your disease, you will just keep burning it down worse and worse and worse. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. So it is plain that life, in, which includes deep resentment, leads only to futility and unhappiness. So for anyone new who wants to hold on to resentments, like some people think that, like, and I was taught this, right? Just hold on to the resentment. But I never heard like the word resentment. I would just be like, that fucking asshole. And then my buddy would be like, yeah, he is a fucking asshole. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'd fucking do that too. I would fucking, I, I never heard the word forgiveness. <laughs> right? The word forgiveness was something people said at church, right? So it wasn't even like I ever had the option of like letting this shit go because it was just the way the world worked. I didn't know you could have an option of fucking forgiving somebody. When I found that out, I was like, can I? How do you do that? And then, which brings me to like letting go. Well, you hear it all the time. Now that we're in recovery, you hear the words all the time. Let it go. Just let it go. You know? Fucking a new person who's one month sober, fucking calling their sponsor, sponsor, just like let, let it go. Let it go. Good luck. Yeah. You can't just let shit go. There's a process of letting shit go. First, you got to look at the truth of things. You got to look at the facts. You got to look at, like most of us will contempt prior to investigation. We're going to judge you before we know the facts about anything about you. Once I learn about you and how you 
you're acting and why you acted that way, then I might be able to go, fuck, I probably would have done the same thing too. Which is why sponsorship becomes so absolutely beautiful and important. Because every time I sit with somebody and when I first started sitting with somebody, I was like, fuck, that's me. I do that. And I'm telling him to fucking go work on that. I'm not working on it. Right? So it holds me accountable. And then when I see this guy like pouring out his heart because he can't stop doing something, a behavior where he's hurting his girlfriend or something. And I'm like, fuck, I've done that. And I'm like, fuck. And I know how painful that is when you don't want to act like that. And you don't want to hurt people, but you keep hurting them and you can't stop. Fuck. I know that pain, bro. And then my heart opens just a little more, right? And then I start understanding that all people are just trying their best. All people are emotionally ill to some degree, spiritually sick, and they do frequently wrong things just like me. And then I quit judging you because you're not adding up to my script that I never gave you, right? So the script needs to get crumpled up and then we just start through this program, we just start accepting other people. Through the acceptance and forgiveness of you for the things you do, I fucking start forgiving myself. And then this kind of all works like a, just all in correlation with each other. So anyway, let's keep going. So it is plain that life which includes deep resentment only leads to futility and unhappiness. To the precise extent that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? That's a really important line. Just to the precise extent that we allow these resentments to rule our life. To what degree am I going to allow it to run my life? Because now I have a choice. Do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? Me holding on and living in resentment, I squander the hours that I could be spending with my kids. That I could be spending with people. And doing things that are fun in my life. And really that line. Like I know there is some new people here. And when you start going through resentments. You're going to not want to let go of a few. Because you're self-righteously. Fuck it. That's, fuck you. That person did this. I fucking. How am I going to forgive him? I always say. Forgive him and fucking be free. Or don't forgive him and be sick. And as you don't forgive them, that fucking manifestation of self will bleed into the rest of your life again. And you're going to be no further along. Forgiveness is freedom, man. But it takes a while and it takes practice. Yes. And what I really loved about what you shared there is your mom's like, if you could just catch a break, you know, you're just life is not treating you right. Like you're getting knocked down and holy fuck. You're just perpetuating your fucking illness, mm -hmm. right? That's exactly why we need God-centered 12-step people to be talking about our lives with because normal people don't get it. And they can fucking do that. But left to you guys and me doing that, I'm fucking banana peel trailing that shit. <laughs> and at the end of banana peel trail, I'm fucking drinking, man. Right? Because that is perpetuating my self-pity, my morbid reflection, Pour me, pour me, pour me another drink. So we need people that are going to call us on our shit. Like, and the reason, like I talked about earlier, that I'm like a little maybe harder on people sometimes is because I do care more about their life than their feelings. And like some of like what you guys see here is not really how I am like behind the doors with my sponsees. Like I can, I'm like a chameleon, man. If I'm working a really passive sponsee, I can really work in a different way and fucking deliver what I need in a really kind and different way, right? What you guys see here in my delivery, yeah, it's pretty hard and fast lines, but I've learned how to like use creator and fucking be a chameleon to work with any type of person, man or woman, and give them what it is that they need in a fucking really good way. And sometimes it is a little hard and fast lines. But it's in a nice way. And sometimes, you know, I've been on the phone and I said, what the fuck are you fucking? Like, I've done that, right? And I've had them hang up on me. 
And then I've had them call me right back and say, do you got fucking, can you meet me in an hour? Right? Because they know. I'm not here for any other reason to fucking other than be helpful. Right? And usually if I'm not mad at a person, they're doing something fucking terribly stupid. And I need to get through to them because I know them and their skull is about this fucking thick. Right? And sometimes... You know, you can't beat them with the big bug. You got to beat them with a bat, right? <laughs> but, you know, like on that note, like the success rate that I have as a sponsor is fucking super high, right? And there's not people running around the fellowship saying what a fucking asshole I am as a sponsor. They say fucking, <coughs> they fucking love me, right? Because I love my sponsees and I love the people I work with and I love people, man. That's just, and that wasn't me before because I fucking hated people. That's how much this program's changed me. That's probably why I love doing this because I can't even believe who I am today, right? My daughters, when I was changing, like three, four years in, they're like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> they were like mad at me because I was changing. They're like, I like the old dad. Where's my old dad? Oh, you like the mean and angry one who road raged and fucking beat people up? Yeah, I kind of did. And they did. But that's what they were used to, right? That was their normal. Okay, so... I'll just finish this paragraph. And then we'll go for a break. And then we will bust into that fourth column of uh, the resentments here. By the end of this... Okay. To the precise sense that we permit these, do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile? But with the alcoholic who's hope and maintenance of a spiritual growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. For we found it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. We're covering up that God part of us, that sunlight of the spirit inside of us with these resentments, with these these things that block us. The insanity of alcohol returns again, or returns and we drink again. So I live in the spiritual malady, and I will drink again. And I don't have a choice in it. That's why in the doctor's opinion said, we succumb to the desire. I don't have a choice. Succumb means fail to resist. And with us to drink is to die. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm are not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. So as Janine was describing with her mom, you know, the grouch and the brainstorm are fine for her mom, but not for Janine. And, and that's, you know, I remember when I first, like I lost my wife, right, through my addiction, but... I remember in that first year or second year, I'd go and just hang out with her. And years ago, we used to like read those like star magazines and choir magazines. And we'd fucking like judge everyone in the magazines and fucking have all these laughs about whatever it was. Just making fun of people and shit. And then like two years later, I'm in recovery and I'm fucking sitting there and she has one of these magazines and she's doing that. And I'm just like, fuck, I want no part of that shit. Like, I changed so much, I didn't want anything. I didn't want the magazine even around me, right? But, yeah, it was pretty interesting. So, yeah, let's take a seven or eight minute break, and then we'll come back in here and blast this last bit off. Thank you for tuning in to the UDR cast. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. The viewpoints and the opinions expressed today were solely of the individual sharing them. If you resonated with this episode, please follow us and share this link with anyone that may benefit from it. Please visit us at billward.life to see everything that we have going on. We can recover one person, one family, one community at a time.